Let's now pick a small segment of the overall attention process that I described in the previous section and look at that segment in more detail. And for the segment, let's take how information derived from just one visual object is selected and processed to generate recommendations appropriate in response to just that object. And for this small segment, we'll shift to a more detailed anatomical and neural level. Recall that visual information from the eye only goes directly to a nucleus called the LGN in the thalamus. This LGN has very heavy reciprocal connectivity with the primary visual cortex V1, which is where visual information enters the cortex. The communication between the LGN and the primary visual cortex passes through the thalamic reticular nucleus, or TRN. If we have a bit closer look at that circuitry, the connectivity between the cortex and the thalamus is specific to cortical layers. And I've also put in the basal ganglia because it's selecting the most strongly recommended release behaviors. And there's also inhibition by microneurons within the thalamic nuclei. But I'll omit some of that for the moment and come back to it later. So what are the information roles of the different connection paths? Well, firstly, there's strong connectivity from the thalamic projection neurons to the pyramidal neurons in layers 4 of V1. Remember, these thalamic neurons are getting strong input from the retina, so the activity of V1 will reflect what's in the visual field. Because layer 4 is connected to layers 2-3 and layers 2-3 to layers 5-6 in a column arrangement, the activity in a column of cortex will reflect activity in some region of the retina. Layer 5 activity targets the basal ganglia, where it's interpreted as recommendations to release the V1 activity in its column to V2 and well beyond for more complex receptive field detections. The basal ganglia produces steady inhibition on all the thalamic projection neurons, so all the thalamic activity is damped down. But if a behavior to release outputs from the cortical column is selected, the inhibition of the corresponding thalamic neurons is reduced. If the inhibition is reduced, the inputs to layer 4 increase, and therefore the corresponding activity going through the layers increases, all the way down to layer 6. Layer 6 targets back to the thalamus, so there will be a lot more activity in this thalamocortical loop. The axons passing between the thalamus and the cortex have side branches onto TRN interneurons. So the increased activity will cause some of those interneurons to be activated. But the TRN neurons, when they're activated, produce sequences of spikes in the gamma band frequency, around 40 Hz. Those spikes target the thalamic neurons and result in the thalamic neuron outputs being modulated to also occur at 40 Hz, but of course out of phase with the incoming inhibitory spikes. The thalamic modulation drives modulation of the corresponding cortical activity throughout the column. And this mechanism, this modulation is the mechanism that effectively implements release of activity from V1 to V2 and beyond. And we talked about this before. I'll review it again though after we've discussed the generation of release recommendations at the neural level. Remember, there's cross inhibition with a within a thalamic nucleus. And this cross inhibition means that the thalamic neurons that go into modulation tend to be a consistent set, and they target a consistent set of cortical neurons. In other words, within the thalamus, there's tuning of the behavior selection to a precise group of cortical neurons. So in information terms, the basal ganglia selects a set of thalamic neurons to implement the recommended release, but within the thalamus, there's some tuning of that selection to identify the most appropriate subset. 